Welcome to our talk on the Pilgrim's Progress. Bunyan's classic might seem a little much when you first get going on it, but just note, next to the Bible, this is probably the single most printed story in the entire English language. It's never been out of print since it came out in the 1600s, so it must make some pretty powerful connections with people. It has inspired literally millions, not just Christians. Many non-Christians and even atheists have listed it as one of the best books they've ever read. Hopefully we'll get a sense for why here. The book has been voraciously devoured across all social classes, from parents reading it to their children, all the way up to highbrow academics in university seminar rooms. So as we move forward, take a deep breath and prepare to open up your imagination, but not randomly or without purpose. The Pilgrim's Progress is imagination with a point, value, and practical life application. As we get started, the question we should ask is, how exactly do we read this book? We've already noticed that not all books are created alike, and each sort has its own needs and expectations. If you read a book of science like a novel or a novel like history, you won't get the half of what it offers. In fact, you might walk away the worse for it, believing outright falsehoods. One of the amazing points about The Pilgrim's Progress is that it is truly a mix of very powerful disciplines and ideas. You need to have multiple cylinders firing at once if you want to get the most out of it. The first two are devotion and theology, or what we might call devotional theology, when properly combined. In the words of John Stott, we should be wary of two opposite and equally inadequate extremes. We must beware equally of an undevotional theology and of an untheological devotion. Let's define our terms. Theology is simply the study of God to find out his nature. We study theology to discover the most precise and rock-solid truths, truths with a capital T, and facts about God that we can. By devotion, we intend that our knowledge takes on real meaning. It involves a, quote, love, loyalty, and enthusiasm, end quote, for the topic that we're studying. I think you can see why Christians in general should be very wary of falling too far to one side or the other. If you adopt an undevotional theology, you can end up with a cold, dead, bare knowledge of God. You can memorize all the hard facts about him that you like, but never know him or love him. In fact, the Bible says that even the demons know these facts. So the mere accumulation of accurate statements about God in themselves accomplishes nothing and cannot save us. I know, for example, that my children are mine, but what does it matter if I don't also love them deeply? On the other hand, the dangers of an untheological devotion are just as great. God is truth, and truth matters to him. If we take the theology out of our devotion, we can easily end up not worshiping him at all. Humans will substitute all manner of nonsense in his place. We must worship him, who he is, and not some mythical or false image that we make up based on our feelings. Our worship must be founded in fact and truth. It must be grounded in theology for it to have real value. Again, I can love all kinds of things, but if I don't love my actual children, is there really much in it? What if I love my dog and treat my dog like my child while neglecting my real son? Is my love for my dog really something good if it comes at the expense of loving my actual true family? The old line is that there can be no doxology, or praise and worship, without theology, and there can be no theology without doxology. So it is. Any real worship of God will be grounded in the truth of theology, and if you want to understand the actual truth of the theology of God, you must worship and praise him by default. God is so powerful. When we know it, we want to praise him. The gospel is so merciful and so loving that when we really grasp it, we can't help but be grateful for it. If you can learn the truth of God and of the gospel and not be compelled to praise, it's a sign that you don't really understand it. And what does this have to do with the Pilgrim's Progress? 
as a book, it must be read simultaneously as a serious theological work and a work of meaningful imaginative fiction. If you just look to one or the other, you're going to be missing much of its value. But Bunyan takes it a step farther. True faith, according to the Bible, takes in three parts of our life. First, we must understand the things we have faith in. That's the theological part. Next, we must really and truly embrace those things. They must actually mean something to us and command our enthusiasm and loyalty. That's the devotional part. But none of this means anything if we don't also add the final part. We must actually apply it in real ways. We must walk the walk, you might say. We have to actually live out our faith in real life every day. It must affect everything we do and actually make a difference to us and to the world around us. As the illustration here describes, we must embrace it with our whole person. We understand it with our head, we embrace it with our hearts, and we walk out what it means with our feet. If any of that is missing, something is very, very wrong. The application here is that Bunyan's book isn't simply theology. It isn't even devotional theology. It's what we might call practical devotional theology. Reading Bunyan properly is to engage with your whole person. He wants you to think deeply theologically, to feel everything you read very personally, and then for the book to change the way you live. It's the same with C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. You should recognize yourself in his characters and allegory, and be able to understand something about yourself and God, and then be able to apply it to your life. In real ways, this is the very picture of what Christ calls us to do in the Gospels. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Your heart and soul are devotional. Your mind is theological. And your strength is practical. Be intentional about looking for ways to use them all as you read. So a bit of background as you get started so you can better understand where Bunyan is coming from. The book was written after the restoration of King Charles II, when Puritans were not always the most popular people in England. In fact, the Church of England, the Anglicans, were legally the only form of worship allowed, and people could be imprisoned and prosecuted for worshiping any other way. Bunyan had originally been an Anglican, but after an intense period of spiritual turmoil, he had become an equally intense Puritan and a popular and gifted preacher. Unfortunately for him, on November 12, 1660, he was arrested and thrown into prison after offering a religious service that was not Anglican, and he would not give the magistrate any assurances that he would not do so again. Bunyan sat in prison for 12 years, waiting for his case to be brought to court. Now, he wasn't in a high-security supermax prison. He was able to earn money and support his family by making shoelaces, and he was even allowed out to visit friends and family at times. But overall, this made for a very unsure future. It also gives you an idea of why the Americans of this and subsequent periods were so keen on the right to a, quote, speedy trial. As you probably well know, The Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory. It is a story where characters stand in for people and ideas. Bunyan used his characters to dramatize the story of his own path to faith and to allow different theological ideas to play themselves out in useful and interesting ways. Through the book, you see him wrestling with doubt, imprisonment, failure, poor judgment, and even suicidal thoughts. Further, putting all of this into an allegory allows the reader to step back and think about things more clearly. For example, saying to your reader that, I'm going to preach at you about hell and suicide, will likely turn many of them off. Telling them that you're going to give them an engaging and imaginative story about hell and suicide is much more likely to get them actually thinking about it. What we see in Bunyan's book is the essential expression of Anglican Puritanism and their own religious outlook. This is especially important as you start your study of history, because almost every modern historian will tell you what they think the Puritans were like, 
and that they think the Puritans were thoroughly disagreeable and even inhuman people. Much of this, though, is because these historians are themselves often quite disagreeable, and Puritan ideas about morality make modern people feel uncomfortable. Here, in the Pilgrim's Progress, you'll get to hear from the Puritans straight up and make your own decisions. You'll have a much better idea of what they really believed and who they were, and therefore be better equipped to understand them. The course of the Pilgrim's Progress is a litany of temptations and dangers beginning with Christian's decision to leave the City of Destruction in search of relief from his burden and to find the Celestial City. While there are many individual events, many of them can be boiled down to two significant, repeated, and related temptations. Christian is to keep on the narrow way, which is clearly marked for him. First, he will be tempted to step off the path to explore or settle for something else other than his goal along the way. Various potential wonders and ways to wealth and power will present themselves to him. Second, he will be tempted to find an easier, faster way to his actual goal. Rather than stick to the straight path, he'll jump stiles into what promise to be greener pastures that are supposed to be shortcuts, or switch roads toward people and villages who promise that they can help him for much less the trouble. No matter what the reason or the path, every time Christian steps out of the right way, it ends in disaster. In fact, more than a few of his fellow travelers are destroyed along the way. In a very real way, this illustrates one of Bunyan's central points. While humanity seeks for eternal life in many ways, all of those but the narrow one lead to destruction. What that looked like in Bunyan's time may have been very different from what it looks like in ours, but the end result in all times is just the same. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the sacrifice of the Son, as we see in 1 John 5, 11 through 13 And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and his life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. Breaking down all of the specific temptations that Christian faces would have to be undertaken in the book itself. Well, exactly what we have in the Pilgrim's Progress. But I do want to mention a few examples for you. What we see in these will hopefully give you some guidance on how to better understand all the wisdom the book has to offer as you go through it. Taking things a bit out of order, if you recall, we've said there were two ways to learn something. By teaching slash study and by experience. The Interpreter's House, when you reach it in the story, represents basically the school of the Holy Spirit. Christian is taken into a series of rooms where he witnesses several scenes. Each of these is an allegory that teaches Christian of a significant danger that he will face in his spiritual life. For example, when Christian enters, he sees a painting of a very serious person whose eyes are looking to heaven and has, quote, the best of books, the Bible, in his hands. This man has his back to the world and a crown over his head as he's speaking truth. This is Bunyan's depiction of a faithful preacher of the word. He knows that many Christians will encounter many false teachers in life, and so the interpreter encourages Christian to study the man closely so that he'll be able to recognize the impostors from the real men of God when he encounters them. A brief look at the world around you should convince you that this is very practical advice indeed for the current day as back in Bunyan's time. How do we recognize the good from the bad? It's worth thinking about, and Bunyan gives us a good start on it. Each of these scenes holds a similar truth that Christian is supposed to internalize, not to mention ourselves. The other way to learn things, as we've mentioned, is by experience. Christian and his friends encounter many allegorical dangers along the way. Some of them Christian handles well, others he fails miserably and has to be rescued out of. One of those temptations is Mr. Worldly Wise Man. He is everything that we might think a demonic influence shouldn't be. He's friendly, concerned for Christian's welfare, and he wants to help. 
He seems to be a profoundly religious and wise man who offers Christian a faster, easier, and better way to be free of his burden. In the end, though, we find that he is deceptive and, had he had his way, he would have sent Christian to his death. Mr. Worldly Wise Man sends Christian off the path to the town of morality, where he assures him that he can find someone who will relieve him of his burden through morality and good living. What he neglects to mention is that Christian will have to pass the way of Mount Sinai, a terrible hill that is likely to come crashing down on him and kill him outright. But even if he gets by the mountain, Christian learns, the man he is sending him to is a cruel master who would have oppressed him all his life and not removed his burden at all. In this encounter, Bunyan is talking about the differences between the moral law, moral living, and the real truth of the gospel. Like worldly wise man, the law promises that if you just follow its precepts faithfully, you can be relieved of your guilt and sin. Unfortunately, when you try it, you find that you can't do it. No one can live a perfect enough life to be justified before God by the law. If you try, you simply fail again and again, and you find yourself crushed not only by your sin, but by the law itself that was supposed to save you. This is personified by Bunyan in Mount Sinai. And even if you get past it, you learn that you make yourself simply a slave to morality and cannot be saved by it. The miracle of the gospel is that in Christ's death, we can have freedom from our sin through him and without satisfying all the impossible perfection of the law. When that happens, moral living isn't the goal, it's the consequence. We live morally because we're justified by God, not because we're seeking justification. Does this mean that the law is useless? Far from it. What we learn is that the law is a guide and a revealer. In the law, we see our failures and realize our need for salvation. But the law itself cannot provide it. Only Christ can, as Mr. Worldly Wise Man should know. Apollyon is another example of how Christian is beset along the way and his enemies try to force him back. The monster Apollyon is the king of the world that Christian is leaving behind, and he is intent on forcing Christian to give up his quest for the celestial city. They fight a terrible pitched battle and Christian is nearly crushed under his enemy's weight, but, by the grace of God, he is able to turn the tide at the end and send Apollyon fleeing into the darkness. Apollyon is a stand-in for the ways and pressures of the world. As a Christian, you have surely felt this already. Yes, you believe, but then there's the constant press of reality that tries to force your attention away from it. Everything physical and in your face, so to speak, seems to be demanding and more important. Why should you go to church when you're exhausted from school or work? Why should you study your Bible or pray when you know that your friends are in the middle of some drama or going somewhere for fun? To Bunyan, that is Apollyon, the world pressing in on you, threatening to press the life out of you. Apollyon also represents a very real, very genuine experience of spiritual warfare. Ironically, while the world tries to command your attention, there are very real spiritual powers who are contending with you and trying to conquer you. It can be very easy to lose focus on this in the midst of the press of the world. And how does Christian survive? By way of the whole armor of God, as mentioned in the book of Ephesians. In particular, it is the sword of the Spirit that gives his foe the final blow. There are many more characters and allegories to keep your eye out for in this vein. One of Bunyan's blessings is that he doesn't want you to be confused about his message. He really wants you to learn from all this stuff. So he's not even attempting to be subtle. Most of the characters are literally named for the allegory they embody. Obstinate, pliable, giant despair, talkative, evangelist, help, hopeful and faithful. It simplifies things greatly for us. Also note that for all the evil or negative personas that come into Christian's way, God also sends help. In this, Bunyan is reminding us not only what virtues we should be looking to copy, but also that we're not in this alone. God is with us, and he will send people into our lives to help us through even the hardest times if we stand fast, trust him, 
and look for them. A final type of stumbling block we'll look at is sent to lure Christian off the path, and it takes the form of places or locations. There are several along the way that are either set as traps for the pilgrims, threats to them, or temptations for them. One of the most significant examples of these exemplifies all of the above, Vanity Fair. Probably modeled after the fair near Bunyan's hometown, it is a place where people can easily buy into virtually every kind of pleasure or vanity imaginable. When the pilgrims refuse, it outrages and embarrasses the people of the fair, and they begin not simply to tempt them, but to pressure and persecute them. Although all that Christian and faith will have to do is give up their faith in their journey, embrace the loves and vanity around them, and live a life of ease, until the city's inevitable destruction, they continue to stand fast. Their resistance results in increasingly brutal treatment and even the ultimate loss, or maybe the reward, for one of them. How applicable is this to modern Christian life? For some of us, this may stop with simple temptation. For some, it might escalate to actual discrimination against us. For others, it might go as far as genuine persecution. Some might even be called to sacrifice their lives for God. Many Christians do around the world, and some even have here in the modern U.S. Bunyan gives us a chance to really think this through before we have to face it for real. The final challenge that Christian must face is in many ways the most challenging. He must cross the river of death in order to enter life. He is almost overwhelmed and his companion, Hopeful, is important to keeping him moving forward through it. We see that death is a genuinely frightening experience, but that again, God will uphold his faithful through it. Even in our younger years, it's definitely important to consider. In the words of the movie National Treasure, death is the debt that all men pay. And it is the one thing that you can be sure you will have to face in this life. Don't believe the lies of the technocrats you hear these days. What can we learn about death from looking at Christian's passage through it? How might we apply what we learn to face the deaths of others, our loved ones, or even our own? All through his message, Bunyan hammers home the encouraging words of Isaiah the prophet. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. What else will you be able to learn from the Pilgrim's Progress? Remember, read it as a whole person, head, heart, and feet, and you might be amazed at the impact it will have on you.